NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Welcome, viewers. Uh, this is the second of two NWP collabs with Catherine Shulton of the New York Times Learning Network. The first collab introduced our audience to Student Voice, an amazing book of student arguments curated by Catherine and a team from the New York Times. This collab features teachers from the National Writing Project who have used the essays in classrooms around the country. And quickly, let's have a quick round of introduction about who's on the screen. Um, please tell us where you live, uh, what grade you teach. Um, so I'll start uh, with you, Catherine. I um, know you're not currently in the classroom, but tell us who you are. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm talking to you from a kitchen in Brooklyn, and uh, I was a high school English teacher for 10 years and a member of the New York City Writing Project from my first year as a teacher. And then I was a, a teacher consultant in the classroom for another nine after that. And if you're doing the math, you'll see that I'm quite old because then I took a job in 2006 at the uh, at the New York Times, and I've been um, an editor at the Learning Network now for 14 years there. So that's Thank me. Thank you, Tashara. You're up next. Okay, I'm Tashara Hilson, and I live in Birmingham, Alabama. I teach at Pinson Valley High School. I teach 11th grade English and 11th grade AP Language. So I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you. Uh, Shawnee McBride. Um, hi, I'm Shawnee McBride and um, I teach um, at Corning High School, which is in Northern California. Um, I teach um, 11th grade um, uh, college prep as well as AP and then I teach a senior AP class as well. And I've been with the Writing Project for, for a long time and I'm very happy to be here. Dylan. I live in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, um, in South Mississippi. I teach 10th grade English at Oak Grove High School in Hattiesburg, and I am a teacher consultant with the South Mississippi Writing Project run through the University of Southern Mississippi. And finally, Dawn. Hi, y'all. I'm Dawn from East Tennessee. I'm in my 27th year of teaching English. I currently teach in Union County in East Tennessee. Um, I teach sophomore English, and I've been with the Writing Project, I uh, think, going on about seven years now. Thank you very much, and my name is Tom Fox. I'm Director of Site Development for the National Writing Project. So a little bit before we hear from the teachers, um, let's uh, turn it over to Catherine to explain how this amazing book came to be and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the process and what's inside of it. Sure. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming and doing this and for using these with your kids. Um, because when Tom explained to me the C3WP philosophy, that to me really is kind of the ideal way to teach argument. And I, I'm jealous of your kids and I'm jealous of the whole way the program rolls out and you know the training that you get. And I'm really thrilled to hear how you used it with them. Um, and I hope you'll consider this too, a two-way street. And if you've got ideas for how we can work with your kids on our site, bring them on because it seems like they'd be ideal, uh, almost audience for us. So side note, you can cut that part out, but I did want to tell you guys that. Um, as for how the book came to be, if you know our site, it's been around 20 some odd years now. And our whole goal is to get kids to you know, have a, have a conversation about what's going on in the world. And we do that in all kinds of ways. We have daily writing prompts and a lot of other things, but we also run annual contests of all kinds. And this one I have to say is the most popular. And I think largely those of you that teach AP will understand um, because, you know, thanks to the Common Core, thanks to AP Lang, et cetera, uh, people really, argument is woven into the curriculum now. And this is one real world application for it. So we probably get 10,000, we, now we'll probably get about 12, 13,000 essays a year. Our new contest will start again in February. Um, and the book, I'll show you the cover if you haven't seen it, because uh, the, the illustration is by a 16 year old and I just love the illustration, um, is a uh, hundred of those. And they were culled from maybe 46,000 essays. So they're a hundred of the best and the most evergreen. And 
you should know that they are judged not just by our staff, but we always get volunteers from the New York Times opinion pages. Um, some household names that you might know volunteer every year to help us judge and pick the arguments that they think are the best ones. So um, that's how it came to be. And uh, the contest, I think, will be in its eighth or ninth year this year. Um, and we, I, boy, I'd love to have your kids participate. So. Yeah. So let's hear, um, I, uh, we asked um, our, our four teachers to use these essays in their classrooms. And um, I, I'm wondering like what happened when you did that? Tell us about it. And uh, we'll begin with Tashara. All right. Well, my students really enjoy um, reading and writing about um, issues that are happening in the culture today. So I've decided to go ahead and use the essay, Breaking the Blue Wall of Silence and Changing the Social Narrative About Policing in America. I thought that this essay would be very good to use with them because um, I, it would serve me and them um, three purposes. One, we could kind of talk about what's going on with the culture today. We know that this is a big issue in the news um, another purpose that it served, it helped us to really look at how to make claims and add evidence. Um, one thing that I really want my 11th grade students, particularly my AP students to learn, is how to add the evidence using H places. And the acronym H places is um, using history, politics, literature, anecdotes, culture, examples, and social. So this essay helped to serve um, all of these. So I allowed the students to first read the essay and they read the essay with a partner. And as they read the essay, I wanted them to go through and highlight examples of H places. And I also wanted them to highlight um, the moves that the author made in the essay. So they got a chance to highlight um, if countering was used, if illustrating was used as well. So they got a chance to go through and discuss that. After they went through and analyzed the moves that the author made and the type of evidence, I asked that they choose a side. So do you agree with the essay? Do you agree with the claim that's made in the essay? And then I ask that they choose that side and make their own claim. So they had an opportunity to look and uh, make their own claim based upon what they read. And this essay was very interesting because it started off with um, the author really, you know, thinking that police officers were heroes. And then after using a personal example or a personal anecdote, the author changed his mind. So it was very interesting for the students to see that um, change within the essay. And I thought that that was very good for them to see that you can start off with one claim and one mindset and change as you get other new evidence and you're able to um, add in that evidence. And that's what this author did. So um, as, look, as we look at age places, of course, that was an example of using a personal anecdote. But this author also used examples of history, politics, and uh, the whole social issue of now, are these police officers still heroes? So I thought it was very interesting for the students to see that change. So after they made their own claims, I wanted them to go in and write their own argument uh, using the same topic, but deciding if they agree or disagree and adding in the appropriate evidence. So they would use the evidence from the essay, but also use the evidence from what they already know and their own personal experiences, their own uh, personal um, experience with history and their lives. So I allowed the students to write their essays and after writing the essays, the students had an opportunity to discuss their essays with the class. And we kind of interacted with the debate. 
So uh, which side was agreed and which side disagreed. And once we did the debate, the students were able to show the evidence that they applied from the essay and the evidence that they applied from their personal lives. So this is how we were able to use the essay. We really um, honed in on making the personal connections, using those personal anecdotes and the countering that occurred in the essay. Thank you, Tashara. All that, right. I it was so interesting. There, no, lots of what you said was interesting, but I thought it was interesting how you turned the the student essay into uh, evidence itself that then yes. the students use to support their argument. So that was yes. really cool. It turns it into a source, you know, a, a source. Yes, that's right. And cool. can I ask a question? Is that allowed in this format? It, it is absolutely <laughs> encouraged. Allowed. Okay. <laughs> Tashara, when you say yes. they have it, then they had a, a debate. What mm -hmm. exactly was the debate? Because like you said, there's a few mm -hmm. things going on in that essay. So what did you boil it down to? Or they boil Well, it? I boiled it down to, um, well, do you think that police officers are heroes? Okay. Or do you think that police officers are villains? So just kind of putting them up against, the, you know, against each other, good guy versus bad guy. And um, some of the students were, you know, of course, they, they were in the middle. And they said, well, I think there are some are heroes and then some are villains. So that made for an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say this about the school, too. The school is very mixed. We have, um, you know, all races and cultures. So it was very interesting to hear the different sides and see, um, you know, just the personal experiences that those students had. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I bet. Especially now when he wrote that yes. essay you know, well before the summer of 2020, so. Right, right. A lot of the students, when they use the the history and the personal evidence that's going on in the news, a lot of them talked about um, Breonna Taylor and George mm -hmm. Floyd, of course. So they were able to really kind of merge in and really be present in this. And I think that this essay was so good now because now we have more evidence in history, so. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else have some questions? Okay. Uh, Shani, what did you do? So Tashara, I love the part where you talked about students um, seeing that they could change their mind and that that, oh, yeah. that was okay, you know, and um, which kind of leads into a little bit into the start of, of what I did. Um, so I used um, the argument um, dinner table politics. Um, and I know Dylan, you used that um, somewhat as well. Um, I think we both kind of did a little different things. Um, but what I did was I built a text set kind of around it um, because I thought there were lots of issues and I just called it conflict and communication. And mm -hmm. so I had students, of course, we read um, that initial um, text um, and I it was so great for students to see that this young person could get their argument published this way. And I think it's just so um, relevant for them to see arguments written by these um, young people. Um, so anyway, um, they read um, arguments on, um, is it okay to, um, um, to talk politics with friends if you don't agree, is it okay to, and then we went into some other areas too, like not regarding politics, is it okay to fight um, over um, texting? Um, is it okay to walk away from a fight? Um, mm -hmm. Is it, so I tried to think of a bunch of different issues like that. And so we read some articles and stu we did this thing called layering, um, which is a C3WP thing where you ask students what they think, they read a thing, and then you go, now what do you think? And it is that whole thing of, Kind of their evolving thought rather than um, finding support for what they already think. So anyway, um, students arrived at a claim and then um, what happened after that is I used the um, argument and I'm going to actually share my screen now um, for so that students could um, look at the, the moves that the um, writer was making and can you guys, I'm going to try to get it to present. Um, and that would be if I hit this little arrow right here. I think my window over here is in the way. So this is the part where they edit, right? Okay. <laughs> um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. You see it? 
Okay. So we all know the moves, or many of us know the moves for forwarding an argument. And so um, I used, um, I'm actually using some of the slides that I used with students um, just because they're all set up. So we read the article to understand it, and then we reread the article to notice what um, the writer was doing. And then they highlighted the writer's claim in pink, and they, then they highlighted the writing moves um, according to color. So my students know that yellow is always authorizing, green is always illustrating, red is always countering, and blue is always extending. So um, we came up with then, um, you know, it looked like this. So um, for those who don't know this argument, it's a great argument about whether or not you know, we should talk politics with our friends and family. And it, the, the claim is basically we need to reach out to others and consider everybody's viewpoint and we need to learn how to talk to each other. But you can see, um, I'm, now I'm gonna zoom in on the introduction for the rest of my talk. We went through and we looked at what she did and they are not done with their arguments yet. They haven't actually finished writing them. And so I'm looking forward to using the rest of this um, as they continue for a mentor text. But, um, we highlighted some of the moves. Um, and then after that, um, we actually took um, her um, opening paragraph and I created paragraph one where I actually took out a lot of the good things that she did and then um, have her full paragraph here and I had students then highlight um, and I have some student work here um, highlight the things that she did that the first paragraph did not so that they could kind of see um, like the Thanksgiving table is a place where people argue was my sentence and then she says the Thanksgiving table is a war zone um, and we talked about what is the difference there um, and I actually modeled how to do this with one of your other arguments, um, Catherine, in that book, um, the, the one um, in three and a half hours, an alarm will go off. Um, and so then anyway, it was just kind of interesting that they noticed that, for instance, there was this sort of parallel repetition here. Um, they noticed the rhetorical question. This girl noticed that there was this word here, Washington, that made, uh, made it very important. Um, so anyway, I was really pleased with, um, with what they were noticing. And then over here, um, this student was noticing that the first part sets up the argument kind of with the problem and then leads to the claim. So um, we, we kind of noticed that this was how she set up her argument or her, excuse me, her introduction. We also kind of, we noticed how the other argument was set up. And then we talked about some other ways to start. Um, and I just want to show you what I got from this. Here's an introduction. And this girl's writing about competition. Um, the constant need to win destroys the simplest and most fun activities. From four-year-olds having tantrums because they did not win to teenagers crying that they did not make it all the way to first place. Being overly competitive can cause people to be less happy, constantly thinking, and then I can't, sorry. Um, the screen's in the way, there we go. Um, thinking of how they didn't win and eventually drag them to the point where they um, no longer enjoy everything they used to unless they get to say, I beat everyone else after it. So I, I mean, I could kind of see her sort of using that introduction to create that. Um, and I don't think I'll read this one because of time, but she did kind of a similar thing here where they, um, she did some illustrating just like um, Bridget Smith did in her essay. Um, and it, it's really effective. Um, and then this kid, the reason I put this one in here is this kid is, he struggles. And we, I have so many struggling, struggling students. I have lots, I have a pretty high EL population. I have several students with IEPs mixed in, mainstreamed in. And this kid, he struggles and he was able to, to crank this out. Good. Fighting to impress is fighting for trouble. And I just, he really grabbed onto that first line thing. And then he did a little bit of illustrating, um, which could use a little revision here, but I was really pleased with that. Um, so then um, I had some introductions that weren't that great. So I regrouped and I thought they're not thinking about their readers. Um, and so um, I asked them if they're thinking about 
their readers. And I said, pretend your reader is someone who doesn't know the assignment and it just wants to read your argument like your history teacher or somebody else, not me. Um, and I said, what if this was your first sentence? And then we talked about how some kids actually used, I have these thinking trackers while they were reading the articles and responding and they just threw this sentence in there for their opening sentence. I used to think they should walk away, but now after what I read, I think they should stay and talk to each other. I mean, I don't know if others have students who start essays this way, but it's just, and we talked about what's missing. Well, then I went on to show them again this, the Thanksgiving table is a war zone. And I said, we know where it is. We know what the problem is. Look at this, your reader is all set up to know what's gonna be looked at, you know, what, what the dilemma is. And so then I wanted to show you what I got after we had that talk. Two parents fighting all the time, a toxic relationship brewing. The kids are just watching, not knowing what they can do to stop it. And I really credit that with that powerful opening line of that um, introduction. Here's another one. Life on the line, walk away. <laughs> and then this one, really straightforward, but misinformation has got to stop. Um, and then lastly, I had the, the great thing about having four sections of this class is I get better each time I teach it. <laughs> so I got to my D period class and I'm like, I got it. These kids really struggled. They're one of my lowest performing. And so I, I, I really not only shared um, Bridget Smith's opening line and reshared and kind of how she gripped us with that opening line. But I looked to, I, then I shared, I was, get, I was gaining all of these great lines from my other classes from my students. So I shared with them the ones that I just shared with you. And there was this kind of momentum that was growing as I shared more and more. And by the time I got to D period, you know, I had these, um, I was sharing these and, and all of this. And then, um, I actually was just putting this together right before the show. So I didn't have time to put them all in here, but I was thrilled with my D period responses. Um, here's one that I just threw in there. And this is this kid, um, Joseph, he, he struggles as well. He wrote this in uh, one 20 minute sitting. Two people exchanging hits and blows. One ends up dead and the other extremely injured. Putting your life and future in jeopardy all for what? Reputation, image, strength, pride. And I know we got that question from Bridget Smith. She asks this question right in there. Fake people have an image to maintain, but re real people just don't care. Now the consequences came and haunted both parties to their graves. Nothing was gained from this either. They could have all been avoided if one person just walked away. So anyway, um, I was just thrilled. I'm thrilled so far with what I'm getting. And like I said, we're still writing these arguments and I'm so grateful to have a mentor text to refer back to throughout the process. Some great, great writing. So thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen and come back. Thank you, Shani. Um, comments or questions? That was so interesting. I mean, for me, that was nothing short of thrilling. <laughs> like, I think yeah. about if, if, like, Bridget Smith and Narayan Dubey, who wrote the piece that Tashara worked on, like, if they knew a bunch of teachers were sitting around showing how their words, you know, they're 15 years old or whatever, could move other kids to do that writing in the way, way you just took us through the whole process, really, like, I might have goosebumps. Thank you. Well, I, it's funny you'd say that. I actually thought that. I thought... I wish she could know that she's- Oh, I'm gonna tell her. Okay, she's <laughs> impacting my students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them to watch this. Be wonderful. Right. Hey, Dylan, you're up next. All right. Um, I ended up uh, doing, uh, using three different articles uh, with my students, uh, just for different, a variety of different reasons, because the three, the three, the three articles that I picked um, represent different challenges and things that my students have been experiencing um, throughout the year. So I, I started off with dinner table with uh, dinner table politics. And I, I, I did this one shortly before the presidential election, right after we had that first meeting when these were shared out with us. And throughout the year, like I try from the very onset to begin to develop this culture of argument within my classroom. Um, 
And I felt that this was a good one for helping students understand, you know, like how to enter into a conversation just because it is, you know, pushing this idea that we need to be able to communicate with, you know, people that have differences in opinions and differences in beliefs and ideologies. Um, so with this one, I used it a little bit differently than I used the other two that I um, ended up by using. The other two that I used were civil obedience and um, in three and a half hours, an alarm will go off. So what I did with dinner table politics is I, I had them just read it one time all the way through just, you know, for basic comprehension to see, just to look at it. And then I really just gave them some very basic instructions. I just, I, I instructed them to, you know, identify what they believe the claim is. And then I wanted them to go back throughout the article and identify the elements that they, you know, felt developed the claim and built the argument. Um, and afterwards, we had a conversation. They wrote down what they noticed, and they they annotated on the um, on the article. And one of the things that they noted was how it kind of breaks away from that formulaic process of writing that they a lot of them have been taught throughout the years. You know, it doesn't fit that traditional five paragraph essay. Um, it also they ma they made a point to note the use of like anecdotal you know evidence to help build the argument because a lot of my students have been told to remove themselves from their writing where all of these essays that we were given, we see one of the things that makes them so effective is inserting, you know, those personal experiences and those anecdotes into the argument. So we just went through and we had some conversations and those were the two big takeaways was the, the involvement that the writer, you know, they included themselves, they included their family in that article and the fact that it does tend to break away from that more formulaic style of writing. So after that, we continued working with argument throughout the next couple of weeks. And we're, you know, we're working on just, you know, continuing and maintaining that culture of argument. Um, and the next article that I used, I waited to use the other two until after the election. And I, then I used civil obedience. I selected that one because my, uh, a lot of my students at the beginning of our school year, we actually, um, our, some of our students organized a walkout and protest of a, uh, a racial slur that was caught being uttered like the first day of school by one of the white students. I mean, the student was never caught and I, that, that was part of the problem is so they organized a walkout and protest of what they felt was not, you know, um, a, um, I don't want to say it's, it wasn't a pro because the school did try, but they, 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 they walked out in protest of, um, I guess what they felt was not a, uh, a fully appropriate response by the school district or the um, school itself. And they were punished for it, not necessarily severely. They weren't like suspended or expelled, but they did receive, you know, office referrals, which does have, you know, different kinds of um, different kinds of drawbacks. So I just I thought that would be one that my students would really kind of be able to empathize with, because many of my students did walk out in August when they get when they did protest. Um, so what we did with civil obedience and in three and a half hours an alarm will go off we specifically focused in on how the authors used evidence so this is where we're getting in like shawnee did i uh, we i we looked at the harris moves and we went throughout and we identified the claim we you know talked about development we focused it specifically on um how they the author was forwarding their argument um and in in civil obedience one of the things my kids pointed out was just how reliant the argument was on on that person's you know the, the anecdotal evidence that that person included whether it be their own personal experience or the you know the evidence that they provided from other schools where you know they had the sanctioned protest that kind of sanitized the act you know the act of protest because it was allowed um and that led to some really good conversations and you know because uh, you know i know at first you know some of them were upset that they had been punished because of the protest and you know i like i know with one in particular you know, she was very upset at the beginning of the year, but, you know, I think that she's kind of come to appreciate as a result of reading this, the fact that, you know, the, the you know, that it was not something that, that it was uncomfortable. It made people uncomfortable. And that was why the protest was impactful and why the, you know, the school did, you know, the district did respond positively um, following the protest. And I know that they're still looking and trying to find the person that uttered the racial slur. Um, but that was that was um, that was definitely so we we definitely um, looked at how they use that anecdotal evidence to illustrate um, the claim and the argument that they were making. And in three and a half hours, um, an alarm will go off. I selected that one 
um, because we just recently, like at the end of October, we switched from a traditional, like we, and like people were back in class with almost like with full class sizes to a hybrid schedule. And I know that the students have been having a really difficult time switching because they're only technically, well, they're only in school physically, the students that are not fully virtual two days a week now. So they're virtual three days, in person two days. And that's really just like wreaked chaos and like on their ability to like get the appropriate amount of sleep every night because they're staying up to all ungodly hours of the night when they're, you know, got their virtual days and they all of a sudden they're expected to get up and be in school by 7.45. Um, so as we read this one, we did the exact same thing as we did with um, civil obedience. We use it as a mentor text to analyze how authors use evidence. And my students really, pay, they, they made a point to note that this one, like in civil obedience, there is a heavy, the author relies heavily on using evidence to illustrate the points that they make. But whereas in civil obedience, a lot of that was more anecdotal evidence. In this one, we see where they do provide us with a lot of like facts, like data, statistics, they do a really good job of, you know, synthesizing the information that they've taken from secondary sources with their own thoughts. Um, so I think that that was a really good, like, and that's one reason I decided to go to that one next is I thought that offered them multiple examples of how you can illustrate with the, with the sources that we use. Um, and we, we kept all, all three of these in mind. And right after we finished going through and analyzing, we just, we, Work, we worked on writing an argument um, on the Electoral College uh, where I pulled some articles from the, from two articles from uh, the room, New York Times Room for Debate uh, that dealt with the Electoral College where it gave, you know, the expert opinions of somebody that was, you know, for keeping it and another for abolishing it. Um, and the, you know, the results of having looked at these articles, these essays by these students, I feel like it really impacted a lot of my students. You know, some of them did kind of retreat to that comfortable zone where they was, you know, they went back to that more formulaic style of writing that they've been expected to do throughout the years. But I will say, I don't think there was, there were not many students where I didn't see where it, they, it impacted them, none at all. Like they were, you know, inserting themselves into the S, into the writing. Um, like I know one student in particular, like her, she introduced the argument like many of these students did using, you know, an anecdote. Um, which is something that I hadn't seen many of them do in the past. Uh, like they were using anecdotal evidence to, like, to as evidence to support the assertions that they were made to, you know, to illustrate, um, to illustrate their statements. Or to, they were using anecdotal evidence from um, from the re excuse me from the most recent election to support the you know the claim that they have. Uh, which is yet again, you know, before they were just trying to pull direct quotes from secondary sources, which is completely okay, but they were using evidence in new and novel ways that I hadn't seen them use in their previous writing. Um, and I mean, I just, I, I'm really happy. I feel like it's these articles have helped them kind of, you know, put their voice into their writing um, and make it a little bit less formal, I guess, but still effective. Mm -hmm. I thought, it was, I thought it was so interesting that you picked the essays that um, directly um, had something to do with what was going on at the school or something that was going on in their lives. And, and that way, because the essays worked in that way, when they wrote their own, it's not as surprising that they would also draw on those same experiences. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, really cool. That. <laughs> Uh, that was amazing to me, especially that description of the protest, how they, how wow. it was like, oh, because her, you know, yes, her whole point is their protest was ridiculous and yours so wasn't, again, thrilling for that one. I think mm -hmm. of the kid who I know quite well at this point, like that's a real unintended consequence of that. Yeah. You know, she knew that real kids protesting felt better. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, yeah. um, the, uh, but one question I have for all you guys and you don't have to answer it now, but I, like, one concern I have having presented this to a bunch of teachers is that I know that, you know, the formulaic five paragraph essay, the lack of the word I, the anecdotal evidence doesn't count. I know that, that that's the message kids have and that may be the message that kids continue to get, which means that this whole book really comes at that and maybe doesn't feel useful or might feel almost upending of something. Mm -hmm. So I'm throwing that out to you, but yeah. 
We so, got may I that. That? Yeah. Don, why don't you go first? And then I think that would be a good thing for all of us to address. I am so excited, Catherine, that you asked that question because I used the, um, I'm a disabled teenager and social media is my lifeline. And so I had my students read and mark the things that they found extraordinary about the, the students writing. And the most common thing I heard from my students was, this just sounds like she's talking to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, yeah, exactly. And isn't it interesting to read? You know, her personal approach to the storytelling and the argument really got my kids' attention. And one thing, one of my higher performing students was like, Miss Files, you would have marked her off for starting a sentence with Anne. Mm -hmm. and I was like, this is an awesome way for us to look at why we choose the words we choose why we make the grammatical choices, why we make the ideological choices, the whole shebang is part of what makes your writing great. And so it, it moved into a really great discussion about author's voice. You know, my students wanted to meet, uh, I think it's, is it Asaka Parks? They mm -hmm. wanted to meet her and talk with her because she sounded approachable to them. Her voice was very welcoming and approachable to them, a lot of them related to her. So I used her article in conjunction with, um, I used her article as a mentor text in conjunction with our study of Hamlet. So we're right in the throes of Hamlet and quarantine back and forth. Um, so it's taken us about six weeks thereabout, um, which is so, so very long. Um, but one of our, one of our judgments on Hamlet is that he's whiny or he's depressed or he's moody or what is wrong with what's up with Hamlet? Well, Hamlet's a teenager, although we don't see that played well out in film, but you know, Hamlet's a college kid, a teenager. He's got a lot of angst. He's got a lot of things to be upset about. My students connected with him the moment someone in the class said, I think Hamlet's depressed. I'm like, what's the evidence for that? So my culminating task for my Hamlet project in the first place was to uh, have my students write about depression in youth, depression in teenagers. Mm. And I'm Shawnee, I can resonate, your words resonated with me so powerfully when you said that this student struggles. So I would like to share an example of an introductory paragraph by Hunter. Hunter has a zero on week 12 of school. He has turned nothing into me at all the whole semester. And when I said, Hamlet's depressed, you think? Hunter's, Hunter just perked up, listened, was interested, and wrote for me, modeled after Park's essay, what I feel like is gold. I am so proud of him. And if I can share it, I'd like to just read it to you really quickly. Please. Depression, it's a curse, an infection, a contagion that can strip your life from you. It's not common for a young adult to suffer from depression. Depression is very hard to deal with. It could potentially lead to fatal decision. Many things cause depression, maybe a death in the family, a loss of a best friend, the end of a relationship, period, and new sentence. And the pain that tags along with depression is excruciating. Personally, depression makes me feel so alone. I get lost in my head in an endless abyss of bad thoughts. The pain is everlasting and just kills me on the inside. I've lost self-esteem. I've lost interest in all the things that would make me happy. And I tend to distance myself from my own friends because my depression and my constant mood changes just bums them out too. Many claim that teenage depression is worsened by the technology in our lives specifically the immediate access to social media at, at the fingertips for social validation, but I don't see it that way. 
Chatting with friends on Snapchat or Instagram is a low stakes way to, way to share my true feelings. And it is easier for me to open up when I don't have to hear my own voice admit what my mind is thinking. That having not even heard his voice for the whole semester, I read that in class and we were having a writing workshop and taking pieces of Park's essay and emulating them. Or, you know, my students were like, so we can just copy what she's done. I said, yeah, absolutely. Let's just copy if, what she has done because this is an award-winning essay by somebody your age. She's just like you. And she has a voice just like you. And so Hunter just started typing this out. He said, hey, can you come look at this? And I'm like, sure, thinking a sentence, if I was lucky. I almost cried standing in that fourth period class, the most challenging class I've had in 30 years of teaching. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hunter, this is going to be talked about with an editor from the New York Times, man. He's like, no, I said, absolutely. You have, you've just blown it out of the water. And I'm really mad at you that this is the first time I've seen anything from you like this, but all is forgiven, all in the same paragraph. So he, um, it just thrilled me that he took so many things from the mentor text, put it in his own paper and he expressed a voice so powerfully, like I don't think I've heard in a long time from a student. And that just, it just summed up what we do for National Writing Project. These kids have a voice, they don't use it most of the time. And when they're given the opportunity to, they can be very powerful. And you said something, Catherine, in your first collab that I watched with Tom, uh, a teenage point of view if honest and well expressed is fascinating. And I absolutely could not believe how this all tied together with my little Hunter in my fourth period class that has driven me crazy all semester, but it just was, it, it was just phenomenal. Ooh. Wow. Yeah, oh my gosh, can anybody talk about that? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was remarkable. It, yeah. it truly was. So a, a high point in my teaching career here, probably close to the end of it, but I just, I was blown away by this kid. So would you say that that's because it happened because these essays um, are so relevant and so they, they, these things that teens are struggling with that they're writing about um, hit so close to home that it, it then um, inspires this spark of, I have something to say. I mean, right? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but um, they're so genuine. And like you said, not some kind of formalized thing um, that they're relatable. Absolutely. And the fact that the um, writer broke some of those conventional grammar rules, beginning a sentence with and, I think there's even a phrase in the first paragraph. Um, my students were pointing out those things like I've graded some of their papers. You know, this is a fragment. Let's consider what we can do here. Um, I, but when I believe when some of them heard, it's okay to write whatever you want to write as long yeah. as you know why and you can tell me why. And, you know, I asked Hunter, I said, why did you start that sentence with and? I read the sentence and it was the most powerful sentence in the whole paragraph. And I kind of thought I knew why. And he said, because depression is excruciating, man. And I'm like, yeah, you're exactly right. He said, that's really what I want to say. And he said, you know, sometimes you just say, and this, and this, and this, but this is really the last and and it's excruciating to hear him even just articulate what he was thinking and the choices he was making rhetorical choices it was just amazing so Catherine to speak very quickly to your concern um I just think that um as far as formula um 
like I love how fresh and unique and different and all the different ways that arguments are put together from the selections that I saw. And, you know, I chose to kind of break down what Bridget Smith did step by step, but I was kind of, it's that tricky line you walk of you don't want to teach formula, but you want to give some options of structure to kids that struggle. And I think I even leaned a little too heavy on focusing on the structure of the thing with my first couple classes. And by the time I got to D period, ironically, the class that I thought would need the structure the most, I loosened up and I talked about what drew us to the essay and what the powerful lines were. And I actually got better writing out of them because I wasn't focusing so much on how did she lay it out. And they sort of naturally then brought in some of the things in whatever order worked for them. You know, so why I still have to learn this, you know, when I've been teaching this long, but I just like that, that it, that it, there's so many different access, access points um, for students to start their writing and to make those moves with their writing. Um, I just, and I think they're smart enough, you know, we have to believe that they're smart enough to know when to make those moves. And that's something that builds with time and experience. But anyway, great resources. I'm taking, this is like page nine of notes, but that last <laughs> sentence, I mean, I think we can really, that is a, that is huge. And I want to say something about what I want to put on the site, thanks to this beautiful conversation. But first, Shawnee, the idea, we don't want to give them a formula, but we do want to offer structure. Oh my God, you just put your finger on the most difficult yeah. balancing act ever, right? Yeah, And I, right. I guess what all of you guys spoke to was, um, you know, relevance, but then individual students reading and pulling out the thing that hit them. And when we talk about mentor text on our site, we always say, what, what move do you want to borrow and why? Like, mm -hmm. why is that move important to you? Um, but Don, um, specifically, this is about your kid, but it's really an invitation to all of you. We're going to do this contest again in the spring. We do it every year. And that's my chance to, quite frankly, promote this book, which you know, I, like that's an uncomfortable thing for an author, but it's not uncomfortable at all for me to like promote these kids. So what one thing I want to do um, is, I mean, and I just thought of this while you were talking and I would use your students words on the site um, if he was be willing to put his, his name and his parents would sign off because it's a yeah. sensitive topic, right? Um, yeah. But I would love to just invite the, maybe your community specifically or anybody who wants to use these essays um, if you want to give me examples of specific paragraphs, lines, whatever, that kids picked out themselves as mentors, and then their examples, I would love to publish those on the site ahead of the contest just to say, hey, this is legit. Like, these are mentor texts. Like, knock yourself out, you know? But it's, a, it's, it's the sincerest form of flattery. You're not stealing. You're repurposing. So, um, exactly. Certainly I would use his, but all of you gave some examples of that. I mean, yours was just the drop dead, the life changer of an example, but yeah. So here's the disclaimer. I may never get another word out of him, right. but what I have here is it's enough for me. I mean, truly that's enough for me for now. So. Right. Well, cannot thank you guys enough. Just, I, I mean, Thank I did, you. I had a conversation with um, the New York City Writing Project about these essays and the very first comment was about how they couldn't actually teach with them because they really would be so different than what teachers wanted. And I, that, because, you know, as I say over and over in the teacher's guide, this isn't the standardized test. That's not what this book is. This is the kind of op-ed that a newspaper would publish. Like right, it would, right because it makes people want to read it. It's because the person writing has authority on the topic. It's, you know, it's not a cut and dried, I can show you my moves. It's moves in the service of the real world, which I think is very much the focus you guys have, you know, in your, in, in everything you're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I know it's a long road to get there with kids who um, have been taught one thing and then this is a little like, what? <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it helps. I mean, all, all of you said this. So what was, first of all, the, the student essays have to do with things that your students care about. Like, so they're in it, you know, they're in it right there. So I care about this. I'm, I'm going to read this. 
it's going to matter. And then um, the writing is so good. <laughs> and it's good because it, it sort of seamlessly integrates uh, passion and, you know, care. And, you know, uh, Dylan talked about the, the presence of personal anecdote in the essays. Um, it, I think it, um, I think it really does work against formulaic writing in a really positive way by offering um, ideas, structures, options. And I mean, there's, there's an endless amount of sentences in the English language. We shouldn't have to use the same ones over and over again. <laughs> so. Very true. Yeah. And one thing that stands out to one thing that really stands out to me with this is just, you know, how this one does help students, you know, find their voice and insert it in their writing, but it also teaches them how to use their, the language that they have and the language skills that they are, right. you know, they use proficiently to, you know, form agency and express themselves mm -hmm. in a way that is logical, well-reasoned and completely understandable by society at large because you know i feel you know they're not all going to write like college students or professors and they need to understand that that's okay and these essays show that you can write and develop a convincing well argue, uh, logical argument using yeah. the language that you already have yeah I, I a bunch of the kids i interviewed um all said the same thing they're like don't sit with that thesaurus at your desk like oh this is for the new york times let me use a much larger word they're like just sound like yourself and yeah yeah in, in the um teacher's guide i took one of the essays that was one of the most popular with our staff a couple of years ago it's called um nothing gets between me and my sushi except plastic maybe and it's um, the, the first sentence is, as an Asian American self-proclaimed millennial foodie, imagine the shock I experienced when I discovered a horrifying truth, plastic cuisine. And it's all about how much garbage there is in the ocean and how fish eat it. And anyway, like what I, I can maybe, I don't know if you can see it, but I, I listened in, I did not say a word while our staff of nine talked about the essay. And I, I mention it, Dylan, because this girl uses the word tummy at one point. She uses like almost like little kid language, but so deftly. And our we were reacting in real time. Like people in my staff were like, she's getting away with it, but this is on the edge right here. You know, and, and like you could just kind of see, you know, oh, she's building an argument here, but now she's kind of undercutting it. I'm not sure. Oh, she's bringing in this, but you know, um, but it is such a, um, as I said in the, in the book, it's true. Before New York City made everyone carry a plastic a bag with them every day because we banned plastic bags before that, this essay got me to carry a reusable bag. I was Every time I would get plastic, I would think of what this kid said. It was so mm -hmm. vivid that it really made me change my own personal behavior. So um, anyway, that's just one in there. But and I think I'll close this off by saying that's our hope is that these students are going to change the world for us to live in, right? Oh my God. Absolutely. Get to right. it. Uh, I want to thank you, Catherine, for all the hard work that you put into this book and the amazing essays. I would like to thank the authors of the essays, all of them, for their amazing writing. And especially to the four of you, Shawnee, Dylan, Tashara and Don for uh, joining us and being such a uh, creative and um, excellent teachers. So um, that wraps it up for today. And All thank right. you. So much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank You're you. To thank you. Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. NWP. NWP.